Father, thank you for your faithfulness, how great it is. Lord, thank you that you love us and that we can come now and continuing in mind and our heart set on worshiping you, that we would sit before you now and hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would speak and it would be your words and your message that goes forth. Lord, I pray that each and every person here, Lord, that they will hear from your word and for each one that they would hear it and they would be impacted by it in their personal life. And Lord, that we would know that you are a true, loving, mighty, powerful God. And that you continue to work in a mighty way today as you have since that time, even before creation and as you created. Lord, you have been a mighty God. And we thank you for it. We praise you for loving us and for bringing us here today that we can continue and worship to you and hearing from your word. And as we do, and then we leave, we will praise you for it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how are you doing this morning? I heard a couple of responses. When you hear the greeting, good morning, how are you? How do you respond? You know, for most people, I even heard a couple of these. Some people said, we're good, I'm fine, things are great. You know, this one, you know, you hear sometimes, I can't complain. Why would I complain? What good will it do, right? Some say, I'm blessed. It's a good, good, good answer. You know, there's one, another one that... For those out here that know who Dave Ramsey is, financial peace and all, you know, if you listen to his radio program or if you've ever read anything or heard from him, you know, his answer is, anybody know? Better than I deserve. You know, you call into the radio. If, if you don't know, Dave Ramsey is, uh, does uh, financial things and Christian financial uh, advice and counsel and and you call into his radio show, and they'll often do, and I think they just want to hear him say it, because, you know, if you're a regular listener, you should know, and, he, you add, and they'll say, uh, um, hey, Dave, how are you? And he says, what? Better than I deserve. I can't do his accent the way he is, but he says, better than I deserve. And then a lot of people, when he will say to them, how are you? They'll say, even though they're calling for financial help, you know, they'll say, better than I deserve. So people have their patented answers. You know, over the years, I've changed a little because I was always, you know, how are you? And I'm fine. A lot of times I'm not fine. And I tell the truth, I'm not fine. I don't give the whole life story, but I say, you know, today is a struggle or, you know, I'm not doing the best. And sometimes people don't like that. They're like, come on, you can be all right, be happy. And well, it's not, you know, got the joy of the Lord, but... There's some different things going on right now. And so, then the question is, how do we respond to someone that answers our question of, how's it going, or how are you doing, and they do give a negative reply? How do we respond when someone says, our world, or their world, is falling apart, and they are struggling? How do we respond when someone says, they're church is falling apart, or they feel the Christian church, the whole, what we call the Church of Christ and the New Testament church, is failing because so many in this world are lost and don't know Christ. How do we respond? We can look at these situations in life as broken down walls, 
It's walls of spiritual strength, standing on God's word, emotional strength of these things that have started to crumble or have actually completely broken down. And so the question is, how do I respond to broken walls? How do you respond to broken walls? How do we as a church respond to broken walls? Broken down walls can be a variety of things in our lives. It can be broken relationships, broken marriages, broken finances, a loss of a job that has broken our emotional strength, broken bodies that ache, a broken view of life. And there was a man in the Bible that had to deal with real, physical, broken down walls. But we can learn today in our life of how he handled and responded to the broken down walls. We can see how we can respond to broken down walls and live in prayer and faith and obedience to God. And this is Nehemiah is who I'm talking about. And we're going to do a study over the next few weeks about Nehemiah. And it's not going to be going verse by verse and totally straight through each and every chapter of Nehemiah, but it'll be more of a survey or a character study of the life of Nehemiah. And so we're going to start by looking, as I said, we wouldn't go verse by verse, but in the first chapter, it's very important to kind of set it up. And so we're going to look at this first chapter of Nehemiah. And so if you're not familiar with Nehemiah, Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. And if you uh, turn in and you get to Psalms, well, you've gone too far. Um, it's before that, but it's not too far before that. So it's, uh, it's in Nehemiah, and, or it's in Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament, and uh, hopefully you can find it there and uh, see that it's Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So if you get to Ezra, Esther, it's in between the two. Not a familiar book sometimes to some people, but we're going to look at this man, Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hadani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So we're going to look at this of Nehemiah. This is God's word, Nehemiah, chapter 1. And it says in this portion, it says, The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Nehemiah received bad news. 
But why was this such bad news? Well, we need to look at this and see kind of the history here. And if you're not familiar with this, just a little brief history is Nehemiah was serving as cupbearer to the king. And the king, we're going to see if we were to keep reading, and you see it right in chapter 2, verse 1, is that he was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, this was a prestigious position, and yet at the same time, Nehemiah was still a slave. He was in exile from his homeland. Nehemiah was a Jew, and this was during the period that the Jews were in exile from their homeland, from Judah, from Jerusalem. And if you want to know more about this, we're not going to do the whole study on this, but this is very important to Nehemiah and very important to the Israelites, and really as we move into today and to knowing Christ in the New Testament church, is what happened with the Israelites. And Jeremiah prophesies of this exile. You can read about it, Jeremiah, uh, really starting kind of in the 20s, 25, 26, 27, kind of through there, but really the entire book of Jeremiah. And then 2 Kings 25 records, and so does Chronicles, and there's other places, but 2 Kings 25 records the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and then how they were captured, and they took the Hebrews back with them. In Daniel 1, many of us may know the names of Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, Daniel 1 speaks of Nebuchadnezzar and going and getting these young men, which included those four men, and bringing them back with them to Babylon. And so the reason is that they were captured is we can sit here and look at the history and the, of the secular worldview is because, you know, it was war and, and the Babylonians and Chaldeans and all these, they wanted power, but it was because of God. And what God was doing is these, the Israelites going all the way back to Abraham and then especially in, in Moses and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we see all these things that God laid down and said, live this way, obey my commandments, and we'll go well with you in the land. But disobey, and I will scatter you out. And that's what he did. And now this is a result of punishment that they are in captivity. And at this time in Nehemiah, it is actually 140 years since they first were taken into captivity. The time of 2 Kings 25 to this time of the 20th year, which we read about here in Nehemiah, when it says... That happened uh, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year. If we just stop there, it's kind of ambiguous, don't really know what that means. But if you go down to, to, to 2-1 in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. And so in that time, the way they counted the years was by whenever a new king came into power. So here we are in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, which brings us to 140 years. Now, I've studied some of this, and I studied it intently this week, and I will just tell you, you can go study on your own if you're like, hey, that doesn't add up. Uh, and there are people that come up, and it's amazing, uh, Christian historians and, and lots of people that come up with some different dates, but they all kind of gauge and around that same period of time that's been 140 years. Now, some of you may also say, well, you know, we read about in Jeremiah that they're going to go into captivity for 70 years. So what's, what's going on here? Well, what, what happened is if we go, there's other, again, you can look in Chronicles and other places, but in Ezra 1, we see that the king that came, so the Babylonians, they were then taken over by the Persians, and the Persians came, and the new king, King Cyrus, this, and this again, it even says in Scripture, that this was orchestrated by God. And as we look at Nehemiah, we're going to look at him and his character, but we always want to remember the sovereignty of God and what God was doing here. And so at that time, the Israelites were able to start going back to uh, Judah and to Jerusalem, and we read about that in Ezra 1 and actually other places, but that's a great uh, shorter book to go look and see what's going on. So some people go back, and then later in Ezra, we read about Ezra actually going back with a group of people, and then we see in Nehemiah records this as well, but then Nehemiah, we will see not today, but as we go through, that he will eventually 
be going back. And so he'll be like the third group of exiles to return to Jerusalem. So are you with me? The biggest point to know is that Nehemiah is a cupbearer to a very, probably the, at that time, the most powerful ruler in the world. He is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, and a cupbearer is a very prestigious position. And so he is there with the king, and he has some good things going for him, but he's still is a slave. He's still not in his homeland. He still has to answer and do what the king says. He could be poisoned because that's his job, is to keep the king from being poisoned. So he's in this position. So now we pick up, and we're going to get into the text and into the outline. And, but it's important to know that. So they're in exile. He's in this, he's, it's, it's a really weird, kind of odd position because he's prestigious. It's good, but he's also not he doesn't have freedom. So it happens as he's this cupbearer in verse 2 that his brother and some others come to uh, there and they meet with him and he asks a question. And so if you follow along the outline, the first is that there is the question. And the question is, is basically, and, uh, and if you, uh, depending on your version, there's actually uh, uh, some of the translations that are more for easy reading, like New Living Translation. It actually says, basically what I have there in the outline is it actually says that he says to them, because it's for today's language, how are things going? What's happening? How are things back home? Now in here, in, in the text that I read, I'm in reading in the ESV, but he basically is acting them. He's like, what's happening? And you don't really see it as a question with a question mark. But he says, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who have survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. He wants to know, how are things going back home? How are things in your life? How are things uh, in, at home? How are things in my homeland? How are things with the people? And so he's asking them these questions. These are questions for us today. How are things? How are things in your life, in your home, in your church, in our country, in our community? And the question then for us is, is to really look at that and to say, spiritually, do we have walls that are broken down? What does that mean? Do we have ways that the enemy is sneaking in and being able to attack us? Do we have ways that we are not spiritually strong and we have not put up barriers or walls that keep us strong in knowing the Lord? We can look at our church and we can see the challenge that we have as a church right now. We don't have a lead pastor. We're in transition. We have different things happening. And we could say, depending on how you want to look at it, we're healthy and we're great and we got people here worshiping in the day. We're going to have kids here tomorrow. We have a lot of great things happening. But at the same time, could the walls be weak? And could there be a way that we could be vulnerable for the enemy to attack? Spiritual walls and gates can become neglected if we don't take care of them and set up strong barriers. As followers of Christ, we need to daily stand strong. And I think of Ephesians 6, and it says to put on the whole armor of God, meaning we need to have all of Christ, and the salvation that we have in Christ, the faith, the shield of faith. We need the sword of the Spirit. God's Word, we need to be prepared to go out with the gospel. And we need to live in peace. And then it says, at the very beginning, when it talks, if you want to go and read that later, in Ephesians 6, it says, at the beginning, it says to stand and stand firm, stand strong. And at the end, it says to strand, stand firm, strong in the Lord. We need to be putting on the armor, and we can look at that as spiritual walls around us to be strong and to be safe with not having them crumble. But what if our walls are crumbling down? You see, that's what her what Nehemiah heard. And in verse 3, we see the problem. The problem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble, great distress, 
great pain and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, its gates are destroyed by fire. They were in the midst of major problems, trouble, strife, and it was a difficult time. It was great trouble, shame, and a broken down wall. And see, Nehemiah knew that this was a problem. He knew that his homeland, his city, his people were not strong and were vulnerable to attack. If you don't know a lot about the history there and the Jerusalem wall, I'll say I don't know exactly everything about it. I wasn't there. But if you look, you can find maps, and you can find maps of how the wall went around the city. And if anyone has read anything with history and all, you know that at that time, a wall around the city was very, very important because it was safety. It was safety for the people. It was physical safety. Like we lock our doors in that city, it was a safety for them to have a strong wall. And then the gates were burned. And so they were vulnerable to attack. And over that period of time, it wasn't just the Babylonians take them away and, and you know, Judah just sat there. If you also, again, you, you read about this, when this happened is there was a remnant, a group of people that were left there. They were basically the paupers, the poor people, and some to be left there just to kind of be in the city. But it continued to be inhabited, and it also continued to be attacked. And it was very vulnerable. And so Nehemiah, when he heard this, he realized this is a problem. He realized it was a problem. Now, it says at the very end of the first chapter, now is the cupbearer to the king. And I mentioned before about Nehemiah being the cupbearer. This is very important because he would have been in that great place, in that great position. And he could have very easily dismissed his brother in this group of people. He could have said, I'm the cupbearer to the king. Leave me alone. I have my duties to the king. I don't have time for you. Instead, they came to see him. He asked the question, how are things going? And then he learned that things are not well. He saw the problem. He could have tossed the problem aside and said, it's not my problem. I'm living in luxury. Yes, I'm not free, but I have a great position. He could have said, I didn't create this problem. It's not my problem. It was my forefathers that disobeyed God. In fact, I'm, I still know who God is. I'm in this foreign land, but I still obey God, and I'm living for him. I'm in a great position. What is this to me? He could have left it alone. And sometimes I think we see the problem, but it's not our problem. But he didn't leave it alone. He needed to respond. And in verse 4, we see the response. We see the response. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. As soon as he heard the words, it says he sat down. These are several things that we really need to see and could kind of gloss over it if we don't really look at it. He asked the question, how are things going? The problem, oh, it's horrible. Everything is, is, the walls are down, there's fire in the gates, and people are in shame, they are in trouble, great trouble. He hears the problem. Here's the thing. How often do we say to people with that greeting that I asked at the beginning, and we just have the good morning, good evening, how you doing, and we just let it go by, and we really don't address the person or listen to the person. He needed to listen and truly hear what his brother and these companions were saying to him. 
And I think often we are too busy with our own lives and do not listen. But Nehemiah heard the response. And then he sat down. Now, he's the cupbearer to the king. I don't know exactly what the cupbearer and how the job was, but I imagine he's moving about. He's the one that says, who can come see the king? He's doing these things. And I just, when I read it, got the impression of, I heard it and I sat down. To me, it means he stopped. He stopped doing what he was doing to really hear and contemplate and think about what his brother and his companions had said. In responding to broken down walls, I think we need to listen to hear and to stop and to sit down. And then it says he wept and he mourned. His home, his homeland where he had family and it was his nation of Israel was vulnerable. And the walls were broken down, and he wept, and he cried. It broke his heart. And then it says he fasted and prayed. He needed to stop. He needed to listen. And oftentimes, I'll have to say that I don't always stop, and I don't always listen. I'm the type of person that I want to be busy about the task and the things that are at hand and get them done. And then we can often not listen. I admit that. And some I need to work on it. As I read this and studied this this week, and as I've said many times, when I preach, I preach to myself as well. And I was like, I really need to think about that. And how often do we hear somebody's problem and not stop? And listen. And I had an experience with this just this morning. And this was shared in not my part of the story, but part of what I'm going to say was shared in Sunday school. But I want to share this as a prayer request, but also a point is that this morning, I get up fairly early in the morning as it is. And then on Sunday mornings, I get up early to prepare for church in the day. And I was up early and I was reviewing and looking over this sermon and preparation and some other things that need to be done. And I got a phone call, and it was very early. And so I wouldn't encourage everyone to call me so early. But I I know this individual, and he also gets up early. And this is regarding Tony Guest. And so if you don't know Tony, he sits right in that back row, typically, And I've known Tony for many years, and he knows he can call me early. And he's only called me early a handful of times, and it's typically been something going on. But I didn't think of it that way, and I answered the phone and said, you know, hey. And, you know, he said, hey, Pastor Mark. And I said, hey, Tony. And I said, the greeting. How's it going? How you doing? And he said, not very good. Now, from the professional jobs I've had throughout my life as a very young man in the military and the Coast Guard, and in my profession, I learned very quickly how to multitask. And I would say I'm pretty good at multitasking. I can talk on the phone, I can work on the computer, and I can write stuff down and do all three of them. That's not always good because you need to listen to people. Again, I'm preaching to myself, and so if some of you are looking at me and going, yeah, you got to stop doing that. I see you do that. Yeah, I know. I know. And at that point, I could have been, I got to get this stuff done. I got to get other stuff done. This is a busy morning. And I could have multitasked. But I knew about this, and it just rung right in my head. Remember, Mark, you got to listen. And I stopped doing everything I was doing, and I listened to what he had to say. Well, he had to say, I won't go into all the details. Some of you have heard it, but if you know Tony, if you don't, you can still pray for him because you can imagine the problem, the challenge, the hard situation, and how do we respond. And his stepson died last night. 
And it's not a distant stepson. He's raised him since he was 10. And it's a very difficult situation. He wanted me to share about and for us to pray. And so do we listen when someone has a difficult situation? Do we take the time? Do we really sit back and hear what they're saying? Because many are hurting. Many are doing great, but then they have something like this that just pops up. And they're like, what do I do now? And they need us to pray for them. And that's what Nehemiah did. He fasted and prayed. If you read Nehemiah 1.1 and then Nehemiah 2.1, it mentions two different months. And this is for four months. It's four months period of time. And he fasted and prayed. Have you ever asked someone, like I did this morning, how are things and received news that's such a grave problem that it stopped you and you dropped to your knees, you wept and mourned and fasted and prayed for four months? How many of us are weeping and mourning and fasting and praying for the lost and our family, our friends, and our community? How many of us have taken the time to hear God's word, to take the time to sit down, to weep and mourn and fast and pray? for our church, for Calvary Baptist Church. He fasted and prayed for four months. And it says he prayed day and night. And so in Nehemiah's fasting and prayer, we can learn from the prayer. And if you see there the prayer, and if you look in your bulletin, many of you will recognize that. It's a type of prayer that is called the Acts Prayer. And we see this in Nehemiah and in these verses. We see adoration in verse 5. And he says in verse 5, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He had, was giving adoration and praise to God. You catch all those things in there that God and heaven, acknowledging who God is, God is great. God is awesome. He has steadfast love. God keeps his covenants. He's an awesome, amazing God. And Nehemiah starts off with that prayer of adoration to God. And then we see from verses 6 through 10, the confession. He prays day and night and is continually fasting and praying, and he confesses his sin. He confesses his sin, his father's household, and Israel's sin. He is specific. He says that we have acted very corruptly, and we have not kept your commandments, your statutes, your rules. And in verse 9, Nehemiah is quoting from Scripture and referring to the promise, to the covenant, that God said that he would punish the Israelites. Remember, that's what I started with, is that they're in exile. And he's now saying, I know, God, we're in exile. I know this is happening, and I know it's because we rebelled against you. We did not keep your word. Leviticus 26, 33 says, And I will scatter you, this is God speaking to the Israelites, and I will scatter you among the nations, and I will unsheathe the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation and your cities shall be waste. This is where Judah, Jerusalem, was at this time. And this was part of Nehemiah's confession. He said, I know, God, we've sinned, but God, I'm crying out to you. Please hear my prayer. And we don't see the word thank you or thank you, God, in the prayer, but I believe there's an attitude of thankfulness and it just worked to be able to show you the Acts prayer. But he has, that does have an attitude of thankfulness. And we don't always have to say it exactly that way, but he has this adoration and thankfulness that leads up to his supplication. And his supplication is, is said at the end of the prayer. And oftentimes, and again, I know I'm guilty of it, is You know, dear God, help me out. I've got this problem. Help me, help me, God. Please help me. And that's our prayer. We are right into supplication. But we haven't acknowledged who God is. 
We haven't praised him for who he is. We haven't thanked him for what we have in him. And we just get right to our supplication. But Nehemiah, at the end, we see his supplication. And he says, O Lord, let your your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He kind of changes and we see that he has been interceding for these four months, but now he is before the, the king and praying. And we'll pick that up next week to see what he does. But he's saying, grant me favor in the presence of this man. He's speaking of the king. He's a cupbearer to the king. He's been interceding and praying and interceding for Israel and praying and fasting for four months. It reminds me of John 17. In John 17, Jesus prayed before he went to the cross. And Jesus prays for his followers and for himself going to the cross and for believers in Christ today. In John 17, 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you believe? Do you believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he indeed did go to the cross and die for your sins and rose the third day? You know, there are people that are praying and interceding on your behalf. If you do not know Christ, if you don't know Christ, well, you don't even have the spiritual walls built. And I pray today that if you don't know him, that you would talk with me and I'd love to know that you realize there's a Savior that we need. Because spiritually speaking, in this message, we have got to build the walls, and then we have got to know that when our walls are broken down, do we respond? Do we listen? Do we sit down? Do we hear what's going on? Do we weep and mourn for those that are lost and for those that are broken? And do we pray and fast? And in our prayer, are we praying and worshiping God or are we just going to supplication? And then are we confessing where we are the one that has been responsible for the walls breaking down and confessing our sins? We need to respond to the broken down walls. And right now, I want to do a little practical application and I'm closing, so... If you don't know, this is on our website. And if anyone says, well, that's wrong, let me know. But I'm pretty sure it's right. Because I got it from documents that I've seen more than once. On Resurrection Sunday, April 1, 1945, the first church service was held for this church. At the April 13, 1945 business meeting, the name Calvary Baptist Church was chosen and approved. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for people like Tony Guest. If those of you that know Dave Miller, this past Thursday, I believe it was, was Wendy's birthday, the first birthday since she passed away. We need, pe- we need to pray for people. We need to pray for those that are on the search committee and for the leadership board as we are looking for a lead pastor. We need to pray for the trustees as they are doing all the different renovation. We need to pray pray for workers to be safe. We need to pray for this church to be about reaching the lost. You see in your bulletin it says, pray, please be in prayer for search committee. Please pray for CEF. We need to pray for our missions. We need to pray for one another and those that are broken. So here's our practical application. We're going to do something called the 1945 prayer. Well, that's not an actual prayer. You pray however you want. I'll give you a challenge. If you have a phone, 
take it out. If, you, if you're like, I don't do phone, you have a calendar, take it out. If you have a bulletin and a pen, you can write it down there. If you have a watch that has an alarm, and I want to challenge you for something, is if you don't know, for those military folks and anyone else that served in that way or those that just know, 1945, that's a time, appeared 1945 prayers a year, 1945 that the church started. But 1945 is also a time, and so the time that we would most of us know is that's 7.45 p.m. So not a.m., 7.45 p.m. So the challenge is set a reminder or an alarm on your phone, on your watch, that will go off every day at 7.45 p.m. So I really encourage you to do it right now. Or right as we end, so you don't forget. Or make a note. Or put a reminder on your phone. And the reason I say that is because when that goes off, that should be the reminder to pray. And to pray for our church. And to pray for those who are broken. Pray for those who are lost. Who need to know the Savior. 1945 prayer. That we are reminded of that. Let's pray right now. Father God, we do come in adoration and praise and thanksgiving because you are a mighty and powerful God. You are a great God. And we confess those times when we have not stopped and listened and heard of the broken people, that we have not stopped and looked at the broken down spiritual walls that need to be rebuilt, and that, Lord, we would today be reminded of that, that we would, Lord, come to you in prayer and fasting, setting aside time to pray for one another, for those that are hurting, and that we would lift up this church, that we would lift up this community, that we would pray for revival, not just to fill these pews, but revival in this community and this land, that people would turn back to you to know you, As we will see with Nehemiah, it started with prayer. There was action, there was things that were done, there was planning, but it started with prayer. Lord, help us to be mindful and to pray, to set that alarm, to set that reminder that, Lord, every evening that this church would be unified and praying at 1945, 7.45 p.m. We will lift up your name in praise and adoration and lift up this church, these people. And we thank you and we praise you for what you will do. For we know Nehemiah, that one man, the mighty work that was done, but it was your work, but it was done through his prayer. Lord, we can pray and we can see you move. And we know that you will. But you're calling us to pray. Help us to be reminded of this today, to be praying and fasting. And we thank you, Lord, for what you will do. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.